Just southwest of Ditchling, up on Clayton Down, stand the two windmills known as Jack and Jill. Jack, in private ownership, is a black tower mill built in 1866 and currently being partially restored. Jack's sister, Jill, is a post mill and is looked after by the Jack and Jill Windmill Society, who leased the mill from Mid-Sussex Council. The mill was built in 1821 and originally stood in what is now Belmont Terrace near Seven Dials in Brighton. But the demand for building land in the 1840s led to Jill being sold to the miller on Clayton Down and sometime around 1851 and 1852 the mill was taken to pieces and brought by ox cart and horse and cart to its present location. Jack was built in 1866 and the two mills ran together from that date until 1906, when milling ceased on Clayton Down. Jill was filled with sacks of chalk to stabilise her, and left to weather the elements. In 1978, the owner of the mills, Henry Longhurst, a well-known golf writer and correspondent, bequeathed Jill to the local council. They decided to pull it down, but after a public meeting, and on the formation of the Jack and Jill Society, the mill was leased to the society, who drew up a restoration programme. In 1986, after years of painstaking work, the mill was restored to working capability and is now open to the public on Sundays and bank holidays from April through to September each year. Here is Jack, currently minus its cap and sweeps, standing in its own private grounds next to Jill. And here is Jill with her sweeps turning on a clear day in early April. In Sussex, the windmill sails are known as sweeps. Part of the ground around the base of the mill is roped off so that no one is harmed by the turning of the sweeps. The mill must always face into the prevailing wind at 24 hours a day and 365 days a year whether anyone is there or not, or else it could well be blown down. A mechanism known as a fan tackle stands at the foot of the steps. When the mill and sweeps face square into the wind, the fan tackle is shielded from the wind and remains still. Should the wind veer to another direction, it catches the fan tackle blades, and by a process of gearing, the blades turn two metal wheels around a stone track until the body of the mill faces into the wind once more. Tradition has got it that the moving parts of a mill are painted white and the stationary parts are painted black. Jill's fan tackle turns the white upper body of Jill, known as the buck, which weighs 23 tonnes. The bottom part of the mill is the roundhouse, originally a storage area for sacks of grain and flour, the body of which covers up the brick columns and the wooden trestle which support the main post. This view shows the main roundhouse door roped off and closed because the prevailing wind at the time of filming was from the northeast, and the sweeps are turning across that part of the grass. A millstone is set into the grass by the door and contains a stone plaque with the word Remolo and the date of 1986. Remolo is Latin for I grind again, and the date commemorates the year when the restoration was completed and Jill ground her first flower for 80 years. Here we have the other door to the roundhouse. These days the roundhouse contains a counter where teas, coffees and homemade cakes, all provided by volunteers from the society, can be bought. The roundhouse also contains a selection of souvenirs and houses some benches which are set outside for visitors on sunny afternoons. You can see the grooves on the inner surface of this millstone. The grooves on the top and bottom stones turn against each other, slicing the grain with the scissor action rather than crushing it with the grinding action. And here are some of the roundhouse ladies, all ready to serve the visitors. All the money from the sales and from the donations boxes goes towards the upkeep of the mill, and all the work of the stewards and the roundhouse staff and of those volunteers who meet to maintain the mill every Saturday is unpaid. This is the view from the back of Jill when the mill is facing directly into the wind. The fan tackle is shielded from the wind by the buck and can't turn. In this clip the mill is now facing almost due east. 
Looking at Jill from the side, you can see the steps leading up from the fan tackle to the first floor of the mill proper. Jill has three floors. The top floor contains the bins at which store the grain to be milled and is called the bin floor. The middle floor, called the stone floor, contains two pairs of millstones and is where the milling takes place. The floor below that, where the steps lead into the main entrance, is the spout floor, so called because the milled flour runs down from the stone floor into sacks hung on wooden spouts. This view from the entrance at the top of the steps changes constantly. Today it faces west, with Wollstonebury Hill to the right of the Fantacle, and a view of the North Downs in the far distance. We're now inside the spout floor and looking in from the entrance. Right in the middle of the floor is the main post, from which the post mill gets its name. All three floors of the mill turn on the bearings at the top of this post, which is made from four pieces of oak banded with iron. The spout floor contains leaflets and posters about mills and their construction, and in its heyday was where the miller controlled both the speed of the sweeps and the flow of the grain from the bin floor down into the stones below. From the back of the spout floor you can see the ladder which leads up onto the stone floor. This quern demonstrates the principle of milling with the top stone turning against the stationary bottom stone. The real mill stones do this on a much, much bigger scale. We're now on the stone floor where the working machinery can be seen. The large reel in the background is at the front of the mill, closest to the sweeps, and it's called the brake reel because the brake drum lies against it. The reel nearest the camera is the tail reel, so called because it's near to the back or tail end of the mill. Both wheels are connected by a wooden wind shaft and each wheel can turn a pair of millstones. The grain is released from its storage bin on the floor above and runs down the chute into a hopper or shoe and from there into the centre of the millstones. The grooves in the interior of the stones slice the grain finer and finer and push what now becomes wholemeal flour towards the perimeter of the stones. The flour then runs down another chute into a sack on the spout floor below. The stones are housed inside a wooden stone case. The belt drive on the left of the picture can operate a flour sieve known as a bolter which can separate wholemeal flour into fine flour, coarse flour and bran. Here you can see the chute down which the grain flows and the hopper from which it drops into the centre of the stones. It's important that the workings of the various cogs and wheels in the mill don't cause sparks because mill dust, like coal dust, is very explosive. For that reason, wood never runs against wood and iron never runs against iron. Wood must always run against iron. This is one of the wallowers or iron gears which mesh with the wooden cogs on the brake or tail wheels and turn the top stone within the case. When the stones are turning it is essential that grain continues to feed into them. If the stones turn against each other without grain to cut, the heat from the friction of the stones would start a fire. So each hopper is fitted with a leather strap which is weighed down by the grain. When the grain level becomes low, the strap is freed and sounds a warning bell, which tells the miller below to release more grain from the bin. This is part of the mechanism which allows the miller to control the rate at which the sweeps turn. A continuous chain by the door on the spout floor and operates an exterior chain reel at the back of the buck. This, in turn, moves a rod right through the wheels and wind shaft to the very front of the sweeps. The pushing and pulling of the rod on a device called a spider allows all the shutters on the four sweeps to be opened and closed simultaneously. As the shutters close, the sweeps catch the wind and move faster. As the shutters open, the sweeps spill the wind and slow down. You can see the chain wheel through this window on the stone floor. Here is the chain wheel as seen from outside the mill, and as it turns the shutters close and the sweep starts to turn. We're now on the top floor of the mill where you can see the top of the brake wheel turning. 
You can also see the sack hoist which allows grain sacks to be hoisted up from the roundhouse to the bin floor and you can see the bins themselves which are filled with grain. And so we'll say farewell to Jack and Jill from their perch up on Clayton Down.